was telling them at the first service that you would think that someone who had gone off on a personal retreat and had an opportunity to rest and rejuvenate would be a little more on the ball this morning. But I think that just as difficult as it was for me to let go when I got there, because that's hard, you know, you're not used to that. It's now difficult for me to rev myself up on the return trip. So we have several announcements this morning. First of all, I just want to um, remind us that next Sunday is the beginning of our Christian year. Next Sunday, we will celebrate the first Sunday of Advent. And we will be decorating tomorrow evening, beginning at 6, our hanging of the greens. It kind of sneaked up on all of us, it seems like, with Thanksgiving coming in between, there's not a lot of time to get this done. But if you're able, 6 o'clock tomorrow night, we'll do hanging of the greens. We always have a good time, so. Our Christmas roll orders are due. You can order through December 5th. You can either call the church office or you can access that vanco.com link and you can pick up a bulletin in the back to get it if you need it. You can order rolls on there. For those of you who are watching at home, let me just read this link. BJ, I need to talk to you about if there's a way to, to show this, but the link is secure dot myvanco.com slash capital L dash capital Z O O capital C slash home. And it's so easy to use. We've had a couple of people who have used the um, uh, the online site for giving the new one that we have and they're just very impressed with how, how user friendly it is. So I think that's all of our announcements for today. Are you ready to worship? Then as we gather together, let us gather in thanksgiving to God. We celebrate this Thanksgiving Sunday, mindful that God has made us and the earth that nurtures us. So we gather in gratitude. We gather in gratitude to one another, and we, but we most especially gather in gratitude to the Lord our God. Let us worship. to offer to any children who might be worshiping with us today through our YouTube worship. If you were here with me today, my first and only question to you would be, what's your favorite thing to eat on Thanksgiving? For me, it's always the pie. Every year, my mother used to make homemade apple, homemade pumpkin, and homemade chocolate cream. They were just delicious. She knew exactly how to make a pie crust to me like no other. So that has always been my favorite thing for Thanksgiving dinner. I wonder what your favorite thing is. What is the thing that you most look forward to? You know, one year I asked my, my daughter Kitty asked me, Mom, what are we having for Thanksgiving dinner? I said, well, turkey. And she said, well, you do know we don't like turkey. And I said, well, then I'll bake a ham. Well, you're gonna make turkey too, right? 
Why? You don't like it. It's not Thanksgiving if you don't have turkey. Needless to say, in my household, we have a turkey and a ham every year on Thanksgiving. And somehow, miraculously, whether they like it or not, it's gone by the end of the week. So I wonder what your favorite thing would be. Once we got that out of the way, I would ask you, who do you thank at the table? Who do you thank on Thanksgiving? Because what I'd like our children to know is that thanking is so extremely important. You thank God for the food and for the blessings of being together. You thank God for the person who cooks. And you thank God for the person who cleans up. And you thank God that there are times when we're able to be together and to share with each other in a good meal. And adults, whose responsibility is it to show our children how to be thanks givers? It's ours. So children, if you need some lessons in Thanksgiving, turn to the adults in your life. And adults, if you need some inspiration on for what to be thankful, turn to the children. Let us pray. Lord, we give you thanks for our children, our young people. We give you thanks for our adults, all who are members of our household of faith. We give you thanks for all that you give to us. Lord, we pray that we will be good models of thanks givers to our children so that in their day, when they are the adults in their world, they will know how to model thanksgiving for theirs. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, we're doing a little bit of a different order today because we are doing our final emphasis on stewardship today. What are your prayer concerns? Your prayer concerns today? Cassie's grandma. Yes, tell me her name again. I don't even know her name. Okay, Cassie's grandma has COVID and is now home recuperating. And how old is she, BJ? 90. So we will pray for Cassie's grandma. Anyone else? How's your neighbor's dog that I forgot to put on the prayer list? He's still, well, he's actually improved a little bit. They put him on a new pain medication. What is his name? Fiddler. Fiddler. But he gained three and a half pounds back, so that's a good sign. Good. Good. I will make sure. Calvin. For our friend and fellow firefighter, Donald May, who passed away last Thursday due to COVID. Uh, oh, that's my my fam time. family of Donald. May, M-A-Y. And he's a neighbor and a fellow firefighter. Fellow firefighter and friend. Anyone else? Before I add mine. Our Ken still needs special prayers. He was supposed to get released to go to rehab this week. And Glenn. Mom's, uh, uh, Ken. Oh, Ken, your friend. He's Stephanie's, Calvin's cousin's dad. Okay. Okay. All right. So we have Cassie's grandma who is um, who has COVID, uh, recovering at home. Fiddler, a neighbor's dog of Patty and Calvin's who has cancer. Grateful that the pain medication is working a little better. We pray for the family of Donald May, a friend and fellow firefighter who passed away. And we pray for Ken, who was hoping to be released to rehab this week, but was not considered ready for that. I would like to add Lynette, who is my daughter-in-law's mother. Um, she has contracted COVID, um, and possibly her mother with whom she has, spends a good deal of time. So I ask prayers for them, and Manny and Dara are quarantining and being um, tested because they were spending time together. And I ask prayer for my granddaughter, Amuna, who has been home this week because a little one in her class tested positive for COVID and she has been running a fever. So prayers for her and her parents, Renee and Rahul. I am glad to be pastor of a church that is faithful in prayer.
to St. Patrick and to St. Thomas Aquinas to lift us up in prayer. Please bow with me. Lord our God, Christ be with us, Christ before us, Christ behind us, Christ in us, Christ beneath us, Christ above us, Christ on our right, Christ on our left, Christ where we lie, Christ where we sit, Christ where we arise. Christ in the heart of everyone who thinks of us. Christ in every eye that sees us. Christ in every ear that hears us. Salvation is of the Lord. Salvation is of the Christ. May your salvation, O Lord, be ever with us. Give us, O Lord, steadfast hearts which no unworthy thought can drag downward. Unconquered hearts which no tribulation can wear out. Upright hearts which no unworthy purpose may tempt aside. Bestow upon us also, O Lord, our God, understanding to know you, diligence to seek you, wisdom to find you, and a faithfulness that may finally embrace you through Jesus Christ, our Lord, in whose name we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from all evil. For thine is the power and the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please join me in prayer. O Lord, as we lift up your word this day, and as we lift up all that we bear in our hearts before you, we pray that you will find us worthy. In Jesus' name, amen. Our scripture reading is from 2 Corinthians, the ninth chapter, verses 6 through 15. The point is this, writes Paul, the one who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and the one who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each of you must give as you have made up your mind, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to provide you with every blessing in abundance, so that by always having enough of everything, you may share abundantly in every good work. As it is written, he scatters abroad, he gives to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed 
for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way for your great generosity, which will produce thanksgiving to God through us. For the rendering of this ministry not only supplies the needs of the saints, but also overflows with many thanksgivings to God. Through the testing of this ministry, you glorify God by your obedience to the confession of the gospel of Christ and by the generosity of your sharing with them and with all others. While they long for you and pray for you because of the surpassing grace of God that he has given you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You know, sometimes I wonder what I'm going to do when my memory gets worse and I still can't get kingdom power and glory right, or when my eyesight gets worse and I lose my place reading the scripture. So I think you all better start praying for me now because I've made a few boo-boos today. Thank you. (laughs) Every Christian learns of the Apostle Paul, a Pharisee born in the city of Tarsus, one who persecuted the early Christians, upholder of Jewish law, indeed a Pharisee, we've heard a lot about them lately, converted on the road to Damascus, ardent and faithful servant thereafter of the Lord Jesus Christ, very well educated and familiar with the customs and language of the Gentiles. Paul was an ardent missionary among the early Christian Gentile communities in Asia Minor and Europe. In his ministry, Paul was a theologian, a reconciler, certainly seen easily from his letters with much experience in resolving conflicts, a preacher, a traveler, a missionary, an organizer, a fundraiser, the glue holding together the early Christian communities, a prisoner for the Lord on a number of occasions. He was a man who dealt with his own infirmities, his own illnesses, and he learned tent making as his trade so that he could support himself in his ministry. I always laugh when we act as if we created the word multitasking about 20 years ago. I think that Paul would beg to differ, that multitasking has been a thing ever since humanity first existed. Paul was also a man of deep gratitude. You know, I've learned in preaching that if you want to know how many times a certain word is used in the Bible, that someone has for sure always done the math. Today I turn to Dr. Mike Bagwell, a Baptist preacher. He helped me out with that question for thanks for today. Just let it say, be said, Paul was a power, uh, well, my question was, how many times did Paul use the word thanks? Here's his response. Paul was a powerfully thankful man. I like that phrase, powerfully thankful. Gratitude pulsed through his veins. By count, Paul uses the words thanks 24 times in his writings. Add one more through his speech to the sailors on that torturous cruise to Rome recorded in Acts. So 25 times. Paul says, thanks. Eleven more times he uses the word in the singular. Thank and thanksgiving can be found seven times as Paul wrote either the churches or his young preachers. Oh, add thanksgivings, the plural, once as well. Then thankful twice, thanked two times also, and even thankfulness once. That adds up to 49 occurrences of the theme of gratefulness either to God vertically or to his companions or addressees horizontally. I love the way he put that. So what can we learn about the word thanks from the original Greek? The word frequently used is ephharisto. Eph means good or well. Charis means grace or joy. Think of the Eucharist, the root of that word. Our celebration of the Last Supper, a pivotal part of the story, is Jesus giving thanks as he offered the bread and the cup to his disciples. It adds dimension to our understanding of the word grace as we offer it before a meal. Finding grace, God's grace, in whatever comes to us in life, opens our hearts in thanksgiving. 
On Thursday, we will sit down to share a meal as family, as friends. We will hopefully offer grace before eating. We might even go around the table and have each person say something for which they are thankful. Now, if you have teenagers at your Thanksgiving table, be sure to do this because they just love that. I believe when you say it, the expression of joy that comes across their faces with the thought, we did that last year. Yeah, I raised some of those teenagers. <laughs> Sometimes things happen to us when we offer thanks, whether it be a simple thank you to a clerk in the store. Sometimes it's thanking someone for caring for us. Sometimes our thanks is for something that didn't happen, a problem or trouble avoided. Sometimes it's for a new day and new possibilities. Sometimes it's for one of the grand passages in and out of this life. What happens to us when we offer thanks? I believe that thanksgiving of any kind opens our hearts to God, reminds us of the grace and joy possible in the faith we share in a creator who wishes for us good and well-being. F. Haristol, I believe that thanksgiving of any kind opens our hearts to doing and being in the name of our gracious God. Do you remember what the word heart means in the Old Testament? Now I'm going to threaten you the same way I did early service. I'm going to give a test one of these days to see, if, to see what gets remembered. The heart in Hebrew refers to the whole of the innermost heart of us. It is the seat of conscience and moral character, the center of the physical, mental, and spiritual life. Our heart is all of who we are. So when I say that I believe that when we give thanks, we open our hearts to God, I believe we open all that we are in the face of the Creator. In this time of the year in which we've been renewing our stewardship and service to God, we've been talking about the heart of our church. God loved Paul. He had to talk about money so often. If he had not, many of the early Christian communities would not have survived. We might not be here if he had not, and I would not be responsible as your pastor if I did not follow suit. Talking about money often makes us uncomfortable, Certainly makes me uncomfortable. Yet just as we could not run our households without it, neither can we run our household of faith without sufficient currency of our time. And so, as did Paul, I need to remind us that our financial giving is crucial to our ministry. Just to sum up those words of Paul again, he talked about how enriched we are through our generosity and that that will produce thanksgiving to us through Christ, through us, excuse me, to God through us. He talks about how we render ministry through the supplies that the needs of the saints exhibit and also overflows with many thanksgivings to God. Paul talked about generosity a lot in what he preached. And so with Paul, I encourage each of us to give financially as we are able. And, not but, but and, I believe that in giving, God requires of us the gift of our hearts. In other words, all of who we are. Throughout the past few weeks, we have been reminded that we are called to give back to God through other ways. Some of us have less. Some of us have more in all the ways that we have lifted up as means of stewardship. In giving, we seek balance among us so that we can all serve and give witness. There are times in life when the best we can do is support others through our prayers and gratitude for their work in church. I remember what it was like to raise five kids and still try to have the energy to get up the stairs at night to go to bed. Then there are times when the tides change and we have more time to give and the opportunity to support those who have little. We could play this out with all the things we promise and commit to God, 
seeking a balance that allows each of us to honor God as best we can in all except prayer. For praying is what creates the balance. Oftentimes during a stewardship campaign, the conversation centers around money. And in the last four weeks, including today, our stewardship committee and I have worked very hard to broaden the idea of what is stewardship. And in doing that, into our second meeting, Penny Christopher reminded us of the words that we say when we join the United Methodist Church, the commitment that we make to support the church and to support God through our prayers, our presence, our gifts, and our service. And as we were working together for our campaign, we learned that a few years ago, the General Conference added service and witness. And so we thought long and hard about how we would bring that message here to church. And you've heard Penny's words. And today you were asked to bring your commitment cards. You got them in the mail. If you did bring them, just hold them with you. We'll use them in a minute. And if you didn't, we have another way to do that. On these cards, you were asked to write what your promise to God will be in offering prayers, presents, gifts, service, and witness. None being valued more than the other, except perhaps, as I said, prayer is something we must all do, for therein we find balance. In other words, we are asking, how will you offer thanks? You know, all the money in the world cannot buy a faithful life. Only the gift of our whole selves, the hearts of our being offered with deep thanksgiving to the God of grace and joy who wants for us our good and well-being will name us faithful. As a young girl, I learned these words from an old hymn. You heard them just a couple of weeks ago. We give thee but thine own, whate'er the gift may be. All that we have is thine alone. A trust, O Lord, from thee. We are stewards. God trusts us to care for that which God gives us. We put an envelope in the plate. We put our feet to the path and go where God calls us. We lift our hands in praise and prayer. We give our minds to thinking through the things we see around us and finding ways to be of service. We give our tongues to giving witness to our Lord Jesus Christ, we are stewards. God trusts us to care for that which God gives us. As we sit down to celebrate the holiday of Thanksgiving this Thursday, let us do so with the conviction of stewards of the Most High God, committed to living a thankful life every day, offering to God our thanks and our praise. Amen. I'd like to ask you now to take this card, if you brought it, and hold it over your heart, hold it over the whole of who you are. And if you didn't bring one, place your hands over your heart. And I'd like to, you to think about what your commitment is to lead the life that Christ calls us to lead. What does it mean to be, as it says on our mirror, a beloved child of God, through whom the goodness of the Lord and the land of living in the land of the living is reflected. And after BJ offers our offertory hymn, then I will offer a prayer of dedication that will speak for everything that we bring before God today. Okay, BJ? I believe in the sound of God Give my all to you. I believe you were sent from above. I give my all to you. You're the one, you're the only one. Love so sweet and pure. Holy Son, all 
our God, as we offer our treasure and hearts to you. May they be used to pass on the promise of hope, of peace, of life, of community to all in need of your gifts and presence in their lives. Amen. The service in our tradition, which includes bringing one into membership in the church, is found in the hymnal as a congregational reaffirmation of the baptismal covenant. In this service of baptism, we are reminded that through the sacrament of baptism, we are initiated into Christ's holy church. For many of us, we don't remember the words of our baptism, but we probably remember the words of our children's baptisms or of others that we have witnessed in our church. We remember that we become part of God's mighty acts of salvation and that new birth comes to us through water and the spirit. And we are promised that this is God's gift to us offered without Christ. As we reaffirm our baptism today, we renew that covenant that others declared for us, perhaps in our own, that we help declare for our children, or that we help declare as members of this household or another for so many throughout the ages. And in it, we find our commitment renewed as well. In baptism, we take time to remember the proclamations of our faith. And so, let me lift up these words of affirmation. We believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. We believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. We believe in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Catholic Church, communion of saints, forgiveness of sins. Resurrection of the body, life everlasting. And there comes a time in the service in which we pour water into the baptismal font and we pray. We pray over that water asking God's blessing. And as we offer that prayer, we remembered that in the beginning nothing existed but chaos, but God swept across the dark waters and brought forth light. We are reminded in a time of baptism of the story of Noah and how God caused a flood to rain down upon the earth and then promised never to flood the earth again. We remember the people of Israel who fled Egypt and had a way carved for them by God through the parting of the Red Sea. Jesus was nurtured in the water of a womb. Jesus was baptized by John, anointed by God's Spirit. All of his disciples were called to share in the same. And so we ask that God will pour out God's Holy Spirit. And by this gift of water, call to our remembrance the grace declared to us in our baptism. For the Lord has washed away our sins and close us with righteousness throughout our days, that dying and rising with Christ, we may share in his final victory. Because of the times in which we live, I've chosen not to invite you to come forward and make a cross with the water on your forehead. But what I would like to have is your agreement that I may do that on your behalf today. Would that be acceptable to you? All right. And so on behalf of all of us this day, I say to you, remember your baptism and be thankful. May the Holy Spirit work within you that having been born through water and the Spirit, you may live as faithful disciples of Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, I do want you to know that there was a, a church one time that was very large, and instead of having people come forward, they got fur boughs and sprinkled everyone.
with the water, but I want to come back next week and be welcome. So I just chose to do it in a little bit more symbolic fashion. BJ, what is our closing hymn? How Great Is Your Faithfulness? This is a song by Chris Tomlin. this card up and if you need another one they're out on the banister fold it up and put it in your wallet put it in your purse put it in your bible put it somewhere where you will not lose it during these months to come and I had this blessing printed separately so that you can fold this up as well and keep them together It's my prayer for all of us that we will remember our commitments and that we will ask for help, perhaps, if we're having trouble fulfilling one. Or that we'll sing for joy, perhaps, when we feel that God has given us so much opportunity to be present to fulfilling one. And that we will keep this blessing in front of us to remind us that we can do all things 
in the love of God, in the embrace of Christ, and with the flame of the Holy Spirit. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the broad expanse of God's love and the abundance of his riches in glory shape your perspective on your own life and needs, including those things which disappoint you. May the eyes of your heart be open to all the blessings which surround you. May this awareness produce a harvest of generosity in your spirit. May thankfulness rise up within you, not just during this short season, but day after day from the early morning watch until you retire for the night. May your prayers reflect gratitude while also acknowledging the needs of others whose situations are so drastically different. May thoughts of Jesus fill your mind and hunger for God drive your soul and love for Lord guide your speech and your actions. And finally, may the grace, peace, and love of the triune God protect defend and empower you to run with perseverance the race marked out for you. Amen. Friends, I wish you all a blessed week.